I would like to start this session. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sydney Nano Meet the Inventor series. So on behalf of Sydney Nano Institute and the um, Early Career Researchers Forum, which um, I represent together with my colleague JJ, uh, we organized this event, and I would like to welcome our today's speaker, the Unicid Investment Manager, Natasha Rawlings. Natasha, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. So, uh, we <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll look forward to your presentation. Um, um, we will focus today on slightly different uh, topics that, than the usual investor series uh, focus. So we'll look at how to commercialize science-based inventions from the UNICEF perspective. Uh, before I uh, pass on the uh, leads to you, I would like to uh, also mention that this session is uh, again moderated and uh, uh, we suggest that if you have any questions as Natasha proceeds with your uh, presentation, you are welcome to place them in the chat or wait until the end of the presentation where uh, we will have the Q&A session at the very end of this uh, talk. Um, thanks again, Natasha, and uh, the stage is yours. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Well, thanks everyone uh, for joining today. Um, I'm really looking for to, forward to your questions later on. So maybe throw them in chat or in Q&A or wherever you need to, to put them so you don't forget them. Um, and I'm going to be talking about commercialising science-based inventions today from my particular point of view, I guess. And I've called it the road less travelled because it's not the usual path that um, you know, uh, staff of the university or any university um, goes on, but it's definitely a path that's being um, beginning to be walked quite a bit. Um, I guess the animal trails are now turning into some more formal trails that uh, researchers can, can follow. So next slide, please, Maria. Okay, so first of all, a little bit about me and, and why am I the perfect person to talk to you about this today. Um, I'll talk a, a little bit about um, bio pictures later, but um, basically I spent a lot of my career uh, in marketing from a, like a direct response point of view, which came in handy further down the track, especially for what I do now in, in commercialising products. I was also a tech founder and CEO at my own high tech startup for a few years. Um, I then went and worked for other people's st startups and, um, and in that time I, I came across Sydney University's Incubate. So, well, this is an old slide. I've actually been um, working with Incubate for five years now, nearly six actually. So it shows you how old this slide is. I'll update it for next time. But I was also the entrepreneur in residence for a few months um, at one point. And I, um, I really love uh, startups and, you know, they are basically small businesses that can grow very, very quickly. Um, so they're a particular subset of small business. And I got very interested in women um, leading those organisations like I was when, when I was CEO. And that's because there's not many of them. So um, I, I tend to do quite a bit around the traps. Uh, in, in normal incubators and accelerators to help uh, women CEOs as well. And I'm now an investment manager at Uniseed, which means I've crossed to the other side of the table in negotiations as the investor, which is, um, I think it's just helping me to make, uh, make myself a better entrepreneur. I'm really a lapsed entrepreneur at the moment. Hope to, to come back to it again one day. And I'm also a board member of three of the startups that we've invested in. And I guess um, it's good to know what your superpower is. And I think mine is really commercialising early stage uh, businesses with hustle. I did a lot of that in my marketing career by creating and launching new products. And I still think I'm continuing to do that. Next one, Maria. Thank you. So what is the problem here? Why don't inventions leave labs? Why is this still a bit of an animal trail instead of a fully forged hiking track? Um, and the reasons um, is that, well, there's many actually, but there's not a lot of money around, um, and I'll go into this a bit more later, but there's not a lot of money around for early stage deep tech companies. Um, there's lots in the software business, B2B software, but there's really nothing in deep technology. And that's because it's, it's very, very risky early on. 
And so what happens is there's this, this massive valley of death, which you might have heard of, which is between, you know, when all the government grants for university research finish and when something is actually ready to be commercialised. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there's not a lot of um, role models for researchers to follow um, if they want to achieve impact with their work. And just generally, Australia really sucks at translating um, getting research out of, of labs. Um, I mean, I think as a, a country, as a nation, we produce 1% of the whole world's research, which is absolutely ridiculous, right, for the size that we are. But um, we're right at the bottom in terms of OECD company, uh, countries in terms of commercialising that research. So this isn't, isn't just my opinion, it's, um, it's actually just borne out in stats. Thanks, Maria. Next one. So I'm going to talk a bit now about um, Uniseed and what it is. So we're an early stage investment fund that works with researchers, businesses and industry to provide the best pathway forward to commercialise cutting edge research edge research so you know we basically free great research from labs so it can get into the world for impact um, and we only we, we work with four different universities including the university of sydney who are our research partners and the csiro and that's because they give us money to invest in their research that can be big business that will make a financial return to them one day as well as other benefits like good pr for instance uh, thank you, Maria. Next one. Uh, we've got quite a successful heritage. So we've actually been around for 21 years this year, which is a long, long time for an investment fund. Most fold um, after 20 years and, uh, or not even that, just 10 years after their first fund's life. And um, we've had quite a bit of success in that time. We've actually got up to 10 exits now. And we do make a decent return for our member uh, universities, which is actually crazy considering where we're investing, which I like to say is the bleeding edge of, of uh, research and, and business. So uh, next one, Maria, thank you. So a little bit about why this is such a lonely road to travel if you're a researcher. Um, the first one, and it's often used for, in, for women as well, is that you can't be what you can't see. Um, there's few role models for academics to follow uh, in this space. I could mention a few out of Sydney um, Uni, so Salah Sakuraya, of course, um, with Agaris, who we funded, and Tony Weiss from, um, uh, from Elastigen's, another one, and we've got a couple in the, the Brain and Mind Centre as well. Um, but, you know, there, there's not many uh, that you guys can go, right, you know, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to become part of a startup or I'm going to help get some research into the world that can make a big startup. There's just not many of them. Um, and to be frank, it's not something universities are set up to do. I mean, you guys are there to educate uh, and to, you know, to provide research. Uh, and it's not your job, or university's job, really, to commercialise inventions. And just generally, if I think about the landscape culturally, there's not a lot of incentive to do this, right? So, um, you know, the, and the incentives aren't there. What are the key performance indicators? Well, most of them are not around getting, um, you know, startups into the world. And if you do, it's going to be a long time before they return money, if ever. So it's, it's not a great priority for most, um, most universities. And, when I talk around the traps and when we start unbundling what it means to be a founder and, you know, leave your um, position at a university, mostly academics say, why would I do this? And they're probably quite right. If they leave, they, they can't often get their position back. So there's lots of ways to, you know, to unpeel this onion, I find. So we'll look at that. Um, but for the brave, I think, and for those who really want to have impact um, in the world in a very, very positive way, because most research coming out of university solves the world's biggest problem, it, I think it can be, having done it myself, the most rewarding and life-transforming journey that you'll ever, ever have. Next slide, please, Maria. So what is your future path or future paths? Um, and I've got to say, as an old lady now, um, having had quite a long career, I look back and I think, well, there's some major themes, but there was never 
you know, there probably was a set path when I started my career, but um, right now I look back and go, well, I took lots of twi twists and turns and over mountains and into valleys, um, and it's all been a fantastic adventure. And there's been a few themes around my superpowers, um, but, you know, that's, that's sort of it. And, and really, like, your careers will be the same. There's no right or wrong direction. If you're on the wrong path, don't forget, you can then go on another one or go back and, and find the path you left and, and try that again. Um, and you've got to ask yourself, I think, do you see yourself as having a career at uni? Um, and if you are, well, how many opportunities are there at your uni and other universities? Or do you want to explore something else? And, you know, startup actually is not a one size fits all. There's actually many different paths to commercialization um in in the startup space so next slide maria so first of all your work um, could actually form a license agreement for the university now you still get some money out of that it's always a third a third a third a third to the university a third to the faculty and a third to the inventors um, and actually that's probably the path that the university should take each and every time because it's the least risky one right you don't have a whole bunch of other uh, problems associated with startups. It's really just a company, you know, taking your research to make more money from it or add, you know, add to, to their current processes to save money or whatever. That's, that's the deal. So that's always the most preferred path, honestly. Um, the other thing you could do is you could stay at the university in your academic role, but your work becomes the basis of the startup. And sometimes you continue to do work for that startup, but still in your university position, uh, because the company that spun out then funds your lab. So, um, oh, sorry, next. <laughs> so that's, there we go. Oh, that one, yep. Uh, so that's always, that's always a good option as well. So you don't have to leave your academic post and you get the best of both worlds. But then you're doing commercial research, right? And it's a lot less about, uh, you know, being that astronaut going off into space and, and discovering new things. Um, it's more about, okay, get this, this uh, next bit of work done in this time slot with this amount of money. And, and that's what the commercial world is. The other thing you can do, which is the one I think most people know about, which is fully spin out your research. Um, so that's where you need to speak to CDIP, which is the tech transfer office at the City um, of University to make sure that you can actually commercialize that research. Because any research done in the uni, quite fairly, as you guys are in, uh, employees, if, if you work for the university, belongs to the university. PhD students, however, you, you do have ownership of your own work at the university. However, if you have a supervisor involved who's employed by the university, then some proportion of your work is going to own, be owned by the university. So it's always best to get on the front foot and check out with the university what they think about you moving ahead to commercialise your, your research. And sometimes you can have something in between all of these, right? So if you look at Salah, um, uh, he is doing, I think, four days a week in the startup and one day a week um, in his academic position. So uh, there's always swings and roundabouts to all of these things, right? So you can still follow your dream and have your cake uh, as well. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying you're going to have a lot of spare time, but quite frankly, in startup, you know, your life is the business um, for many, many years as you get it off the ground. So thank you, Maria. Next one. So now let's pull all of this up a bit and talk about startups and how they get funded. And, and then you start coming into my world um, a little bit more, which is, you know, which is investment. So on one side, you've got non-equity financing. That means uh, you get money that doesn't take a, a bit of your business and you pay back interest, for example, or you get a, a government grant, which most of you are probably quite um, familiar with. And on the other side is equity financing, which is where you get money and the investors, like myself, take a bit of a, a, a chunk of the, of the business. So we, we fit at UniSeed into, into venture capital. Maria, next one. Okay, so what is venture? Um, what is venture capital? You can see by my picture, I'm being a little bit cheeky because it is money with strings attached, right? So nothing is free in the world, um, and not only do we take a chunk of the business, but 
we usually have a lot of terms around that money, like getting our money out first if something goes wrong. So we protect the downside for our investors, in this case, the universities who have given us money to invest. Basically, I can say it's expensive, but smart money. Um, you know, we should bring some good skills to the table. Um, we do more than just passively invest our money. We get really involved. You know, I told you I sit on the boards of the businesses and I do quite a lot of work for those businesses as well. And typically we want to invest in uh, companies like most investors that can be really big. And the reason for that is it protects our down downside. So, you know, only, you know, I'd say two to three successes out of every 10 companies is probably on the high side. It's more like one to two. One might do very, very well and one might break even and the rest are probably, you know, going to be walking dead that, you know, maybe are good businesses but are not businesses that we can ever get our money out of or fail and are complete write-offs. Um, so that's next slide now, Marie. Thank you. Um, so I also thought I'd cover commercial grants because um, I actually sit on a few committees here and there that... Um, like the Physical Sciences Fund for the New South Wales Chief Scientist. Um, and, you know, I get to put my opinion forward as to whether um, the government should give out grants or not. And these are commercial grants, by the way, not, uh, you know, not, not research grants. And I just wanted to put this forward because, yes, it is a way that you can get money, um, but it's there for a purpose, I guess. It's, it's there to... Um, you know, get great products into the market. It's there to create jobs. It's there to create extra money in the community. It's building value for the state or the country, um, you know, and it's to keep Australia's economy strong and vibrant into the future. Um, but if you're not demonstrating that you can be a big business one day, then you're not going to go very well in those grants. And, um, and that's because you are competing against commercial businesses which you know know how to um, know how to speak to speak a little bit better, know how to put for, put forward a business case a bit better. Um, so just be aware that when you go into those things, unless you you know really get the help of um, you know someone from CDIP or you know in business development at the university, you might you might be struggling a little bit. But I'm going to give you some secrets later on anyway about how you can do that well. Next slide, Maria. Thank you. Um, so I thought I'd just talk about the hard stuff first. Um, so when I meet lots of researchers at the university and I, I really, really love it, but like this picture says, it can be quite frustrating sometimes. Um, and it's because we are speaking different languages actually. And I guess that I am there for a different purpose as to what uh, a lot of people that researchers and academics might meet in their day to day. And so, you know, coming from a sales background, and, and you've got to think of yourself as a salesperson as well, you've got to think about what does the other person want to hear? And actually, what I don't want to hear a lot about is actually the science of your invention. Uh, first of all, I am not a scientist, but I'm a bit of a geek, so I do like science. But Actually, I'm there for a very different purpose. I'm there to find out whether what you've got can make a big business one day. And I'm going to give you the secrets as to how you can have a successful conversation with someone like me. The other thing I just wanted to say is it's pretty common for me not to be able to get a word in to ask questions. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so I, I find that as a general pattern. And, and that really says something because I am someone who doesn't shut up and actually is is not very good myself. I, I do realise that as a, as a weakness where I don't let other people get a word in sometimes. So, you know, really allow space for the other person to ask you questions because then you might get the conversation on the, on the right track and about what they're interested in. Um, and on this point, the only thing that I'm really interested in is making money for my fund because that's what I'm judged on. So unless I can get to those answers pretty quickly or have a path going forward to those answers, I'm probably not going to have another conversation with you. So just have a think about that when you're approaching an investor. That's what they're most interested in. Um, so, um, and like I said, this can be learnt. And if you can do this from the beginning, you're going to go far in conversations with someone like me. So next, next slide, Maria. 
So it's really simple, actually. It's, it's definitely not rocket science. Some of you might even be rocket scientists today, but it's really not that. And the crux of it is, is you've just got to solve a real problem for a set of customers. And there's actually got to be a lot of those customers or be a high value problem to give me a big opportunity to go after. And that's what I'm, I'm talking about market size. Um, and it's quite, it, it's a really, really simple concept, but it's missed by most researchers at universities because you guys most of the time are trying to crack hard science problems. You're not trying to crack real world problems that someone will pay for. Um, and like I said, and I keep saying it, this is something you can learn. Even people without commercial experience don't really know how to do this. It's not necessarily obvious, but they learn how to do this pretty quickly too. And you've got to learn how to compete with them. Next slide, Maria. So the foundation of every good investor story, every single time is you, sorry, that's my dog, talking about the customer. I think she'll be all right if I give her a pat. Next slide, thanks, Maria. <laughs> so why is the customer so important? Well, without customers, there's no businesses. And if you don't have the customer in mind from the beginning, you're probably solving a customer a problem that they don't care about. So actually the best science for investors, not just jet, not regular great science, because there's lot, there's definitely lots of that, but great science that I'm gonna care about is probably where you started trying to solve a customer problem from the beginning, not trying to retrofit it. So most days I see research that has been fair enough research for research's sake, that is trying to find a market and trying to find a customer problem. But if you actually start from the customer problem, then you're probably gonna find something that hits the mark. As long as you answer other questions too, and I'm gonna get onto those. Um, and by the way, if you're going to be solving a problem that people are going to care about in 10 years, it's a wrong investment opportunity for me because we need to have a real business pretty soon rather than in the future. So um, getting the timing right in an investment is actually the difference between being right and wrong for me. Um, timing tends to be everything. Okay, Maria, next slide. So, um, so why is the customer important, even for deep technology, um, where I can't see customer proof? Well, I need some sort of proof point that people are gonna want this. Um, and understanding your customers and how to get them happy, like I said, is the, is the most important thing. And there are proof points you can get without necessarily getting money in the bank, which is what I would look for in most other businesses. Uh, and what I mean by deep tech, by the way, is usually tech out of a lab underpinned by patents, but not necessarily always. Okay, next slide, Maria. Okay, so what do investors want in a regular company? Um, well, we look for people. Uh, people are everything. The product, because they can execute a product, a really great product and an opportunity. And it's got to be a very big opportunity rule of thumb, a billion dollars uh, market or bigger. And that's just for what you do, not what every one does in that space. But if you solve your solution at the price that makes sense to the market and you as a business to make money, and you sold to everyone in the world who could buy your product or service, that's the opportunity, not however many people are playing in it. Um, so the next thing is, um, proof points, right? And that usually means customer traction or, you know, how many customers, how much money they've given you and how you're growing as a business. Has the team got tenacity, grit, resilience? We want all of that and more. We want to know that you've really suffered, that you've gone through some pain because you're going to go through a lot more. The startup path is really not an easy one. And we also want endless hustle by everyone, right? And that includes the CTO as well. Everyone in the business has got to be able to sell. Um, if you want to read more about this, uh, there was a Medium blog post a couple of years back by um, Melanie Perkins from Canva. Even though what she's doing, what you wouldn't classify as deep tech, still makes really, really great reading as to, you know, the lessons that, that you can learn on this journey. Next slide, please, Maria. 
Okay, but when you're investing in deep tech, you don't necessarily need the people. You don't really need the product yet. You need a path to the product. You need a proof of concept for sure. That's where we need it. We need a working prototype, but we definitely need the opportunity to be big. We may not need money in the bank, but the best entrepreneurs that I've invested in have got purchase orders from customers who can't buy the product yet, but really want to. So Wildlife Drones um, had $165,000 in customer purchase orders that she couldn't fulfill because she couldn't get her product from proof of concept to stand alone at the next stage. Um, Foresight Motorcycle Helmets had 400 customer questionnaires answered um, and that took at least 10 minutes each. Those people were really, really keen to get that product. Um, so you can get other proof points. I definitely, however, want to see tenacity, grit and resilience. I don't necessarily need to see hustle, but it really, really helps. You get big brownie points in, in my books, but you've got to leave your ego at the door. You've got to be easy to work with. I don't care how smart you are and other investors will the same, be the same. If you can't be worked with, because you're going to have to work with some team eventually, even, even, you're, even if you're pushing off your um, invention, it just won't work. Next slide, please, Maria. Um, so this is what investors are generally looking for in university tech. We want some proof that customers will buy. Questionnaires, order form, customer letters. Um, whatever you've got as proof is really, really good. A moat as a patent would be good or if you're going to be first to market uh, and that you can execute. Um, that there's not too much competing research. What, re what have researchers published elsewhere? That's really important. We do need proof of concept and a working prototype, which I mentioned. Um, we do need things like the business model. We need to know things like exit, who will you sell to, and your risks if we invest in you. Uh, we want to understand a lot about the competition and how you're better. We want to understand can people work with you. Um, we want a very simple company structure. That usually just means the university has equity, um, equity in the business. We don't want, um, you know, sort of crazy license agreements that don't belong to the company. That won't commercialise well. And we want a realistic valuation. That's the money that your company is valued at before we put money in. Um, and this is all, we, we need to know very little about the product, as you can see. It's actually just one line on there in blue. The rest is all about the business. Maria, can I ask for time, how we're going on time? Um, I think we are fine so far, Natasha. So, um... You'll probably have another 15 minutes if you're... 15 minutes, uh, great. All right, that's great. I'm doing well then for thanks. once. Terrific. Um, next slide, please. So I told you that I'm going to give you the secret sauce to talking about me today. Um, but you might want to actually use this in other situations, even at research conferences and things like that, because I find sometimes that you guys even forget how to talk to each other outside of your own faculty. So this is really helpful. If you're working a room or you're introducing yourself, this is your bio pitch, your biography pitch, um, you know, at, at an event. So you can do this in 30 seconds to a minute, right? And if you dot it with enough interesting things, people will keep asking questions, which makes it a much more lively conversation, i.e. two way, rather than just like a diatribe of what you've got to, to or, um, a monologue rather, to, to talk to people about. So, your name, the name of the institution that you work for in your faculty and department, the problem you're solving. What awful, horrible, nasty problem are you solving for customers? And who are those customers? The solution you're working on, don't make it too technical. Make it for someone that, something that anyone could understand, even your parents. Hopefully they're not scientists and you, you get that, what I'm saying there. And, um, and, and what you need to get your solution to the people who need it, right? And that's called your ask. All right, Maria, next slide. So the elements of good pitch, I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but your story really counts, especially if there's some sort of personal element. Remember, you've got to sell. Everyone who's approaching me is selling something. I wanna know about 
how I can grow this into a big business to return to my funds. That's how my ease prick up. You've got to have focus. Don't try and do something for everyone. Have one very thin customer group, the thin wedge of a customer group you're starting with. You're trying to solve everyone's problems. You're never going to get this business off the ground. And also think about things from a customer's perspective rather than your perspective, uh, which might be a scientific one. Next slide, Maria. And then the perfect pitch, then talk about who is in your team. So here's your story. This is the bio pitch. Why are you the perfect person to be doing this business? What's your background? What's your personal story here? Even if you've gone out talking to a whole lot of customers and really felt their pain, it's really, really important. Who are your advisors and directors if you have any? Right from the beginning, get some good people on your team that can give you advice. Um, and can you describe what you're doing in one sentence? And think of this from a customer's point of view. Um, when I remember back to Street Hawk, which, which was a mobile shopping solution with a location-based um, angle, big data angle as well, I called myself in one pitch the lightsaber of retailing. Now that doesn't make any sense to you, but it makes sense to my customers who are retailers who needed a secret weapon. So if you can come up with something like that, that people can unpack, it's a lot more interesting. And if you're pitching, repeating it, repeat it three times throughout the pitch. Um, and people will go away not remembering everything, but they'll remember that one line and then they'll pick it, they'll put it together from that. So say something that's memorable and interesting. Next slide, please, Maria. So then we go into the problem. What is the problem you are trying to solve? Why is it so painful? to people or organisations? And what are they doing right now to alleviate their pain? Um, and then try and talk about that pain in terms of the cost or the time that it's, it's, it's costing them in other ways, or you know, does it provide risk for the company or a personal level? You've got to try and figure out why the problem is painful. And you can do that if you do customer validation. And I forgot to put it at the end here, but if you want to start on this journey, um, I would definitely uh, go to um, the Incubate program, Proto X. Um, you, can, you can put your name down for the next cohort, which will be happening, I think, towards the end of the year, and they're going through one at the moment, but that will take you through these processes like customer validation. It's painful. You've got to go and talk to customers who tell you that you're not on the right track, but hopefully what you'll do is you'll find a real problem there that you might be able to solve in another way or in a completely different way to what you thought. Next slide, Maria. And then the solution. So demonstrate the solution if you have it. So if you've got some sort of device, even at prototype stage, bring it with you or bring a video of it with you or bring pictures of it with you. Give me something to believe in so that I know that you can actually do something and it's a bit further along than an idea. By the way, talking to me when you've got an idea is still great. I'll still talk to people about their ideas if I think that um, it might be an investment for Uniseed at some point. So it's good to take me on your journey and then I can see what type of person you are and if I can work with you in the future. Um, talk about why you're different to the competition. Why are you better? I like those matrices where you've got, you know, your company down one side and a whole lot of benefits down the other side with ticks and crosses. And of course, you're on the far right high end side with a whole bunch of ticks. It's really helpful for people like me. Explain your IP and your technology. If you've got patents, we'll want to know what they are and, and, and generally what they're about. And what is your unique selling the proposition? What is the thing that you will be making that customers care about more than anything else? That's really, really important. Next slide, please. Thank you, Maria. And then what is the opportunity? Now, remember I talked about this. People always get the opportunity wrong. Even I did beginning this process, right, as an investor, and I realised I'd done it wrong for years. It's actually the market size in terms of dollars, in terms of what you could sell. So often top down is not very helpful. You get that in those big market reports. They say everyone in the area of, med you know, the medical device industry is worth, I don't know, trillions of dollars every year, but that's not your market. Your market is how much would you, would the market be if you could sell to 
every single customer at your average order value. That is what the opportunity is. So remember that and you'll get extra brownie points, points from investors because they're trying to put that together while you're talking. Next slide, please, Maria. And then the competition. So who is your closest competition in the market? I think I mentioned this already, didn't I? I don't want to bore you. But there's that matrix I was um, telling you about. And also, if you've got blue sky in your product, tell us about how your product will change over time as well. That's really important as well. Uh, and if you're answering different uh, problems or different markets, because then we know that there's extra opportunities or a bit of a, a backup plan if things uh, don't work out for your initial market. Next slide, please, Maria. Okay, the business model. So this is really, really, really important to people like me. How are you gonna make money? So first of all, what can you sell at? What can the market bear? And what is your product or service gonna cost, right? And the difference is your margin. And that's what you need to fund every other bit of your business. So that's really important. I wanna know about your pricing, your average account size, your lifetime value, like are your contracts for three years or five years are you thinking? How do people usually buy in your industry? You know, in wildlife, pretty much everything is rented. So that's important to know. What's your churn? You know, you get customers on, how many leave you and how often do they leave you? Um, if you've got a website, which is part of your sales funnel, I wanna know all the metrics of that. How many people visit your website? How many sign up from the newsletter? How many then go on to buy from the emails that you send them and how often? All of those things are really, really important. Your sales and distribution model. Um, so important in business to business. How are you gonna generate leads? How are you gonna convert those leads? How big is your sales force? Um, you know, do they have to go to 10 conferences a year, which they may, to get all of their leads? Um, you know, usually with business to business, it takes two years or, you know, for um, a lead to convert to a sale. So, you know, we're really asking those types of things. And if you can find out some of that information from your customers about how they buy before you speak to people like us, you will go so far in this game because hardly anyone ever goes to the trouble of doing that. It's actually one of the first questions I have. Um, and what milestones are you realistically going to hit with new capital? So usually we, you know, we say, great, we're going to give you $500,000 in the next 18 months, but these are the things we want you to achieve. And if you don't achieve that, then we probably can't invest any further. And that usually means the company can't go forward. So just keep those things in mind. Realistically is, is definitely the, the key word in that sentence. Next um, slide, Maria, thank you. So finally, the ask, what do you want? Now remember, you could just be starting an initial conversation. You could just ask to keep in touch with me or send me updates. And I'm never gonna say no, right? Or are you okay to be, you know, for you to get my help from time to time? People can really, never say no to people who ask for help. It's a hard psychological thing. So usually people are gonna say yes, right? So try and come out of every conversation you have with an ask. And I'm, I've got an ask for you guys today as well, which I'll ask right at the end. Um, you know, um, financials, including valuation expectations, how much is your business worth? Uh, if you've got a software product that has a few customers and you're very early on, You've got your minimal viable product. I know these are a whole lot of words that you don't understand, but all I'm saying is really early on. Then you're probably going to be valued at a million and a half to two million bucks, right? I really hate seeing valuations, especially in deep tech, that are 10 million bucks. Doesn't matter how much research partners have spent on getting your, um, your research, you know, to this level of prototype. An investor usually can't make much money if they're not going to um, get a good, decent of decent amount of uh, equity or, you know, a percentage of the business to begin with. How much money you're looking to raise is also obviously a common one. The milestones that you're gonna hit, which I just talked about with the capital that you get, uh, your burn rate, you know, it's gonna last me 18 months with my current costs or the costs that I'm gonna start bearing with the business to get me to uh, reach my milestones. Um, and I think I've just, doubled up there. So next slide, Maria, please. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's the thank you. That's good. So my ask to you guys today, and I'm looking forward to
questions, but um, my ask is that if you've got an invention that you think is solving a, a customer problem, uh, whether you know whether the uni owns a bit of it or not, or the whole thing, I'd love to chat to you. So please reach out on my email, which is n.rawlings at unic.com or just Natasha Rawlings on LinkedIn will reach me or at Tasha Saar on uh, Twitter, which I'm less active in these days, I've got to admit. So that's it. And awesome. I've got a bit of extra time for questions. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, so we've got a few questions which we um, uh, will moderate now. JJ, right. would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Natasha, for that really inspiring and interesting talk. Um, I'm sure most, like all of us here, would find it really helpful, especially for researchers, and it was pitched exactly towards what we needed to know. Um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to put them into the chat now or just raise your hand um, to ask it by the mic. But I might start with some, and I think you answered some of my questions. <laughs> um, but you know, like uh, the first one I had, uh, what are the most important aspects? And I think you already told us that, um, you know, the science is probably not as interesting as like, you know, the practical stuff around it, which is great. But um, I guess um, I wanted a bit more elaboration about like what kinds of inventions would work best for a commercial pitch? Like obviously if there's a technology or product, that would be great. But then a lot of us might be doing basic science research and it could be like a, a molecular pathway that's involved in this particular cell in a disease. Like yeah. is that the sort of thing that could still be pitched? Like, you know, Absolutely. As you said, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and really the pitch do anything until 10 years down the track, right? <laughs> yeah, well, but that's okay. So that, that's a really good point actually to, to look at the different difference between, you know, like drug development and, um, you know, everything else, basically. Um, and so Uniseed, I should, being a deep tech fund, very early stage, we actually have an evergreen fund. So don't, we don't have a 10 year hard stop because half of what we, um, half of what we do is drug development. Um, and so, you know, we take uh, a novel discovery out of a university or the CSIRO and we put it in a commercial business, which is basically, you know, not like other things, but is lab work when you're doing drug development. And so at that point, um, we, we want to have the two, um, you know, animal studies done. We want the small animal study and the large animal study. We want to lead. Um, a lead molecule. So I, I don't understand all the science behind that, but that's the point to pitch to Uniseed. Although, obviously, if you're working on something and it looks interesting in, in your small animals, then we'd probably like to hear about it. Um, and, and it wouldn't be me you'd be speaking to, it'd be my lovely colleague, John Kurak, um, who looks at that. But in terms of other areas, like really with Uniseed, and it's actually really important to understand the investor you're pitching to and whether they're, if they'd ever even invest in what you're doing. So for one, most funds in Australia do not um, invest in biotech, but there's a lot of um, high net worth investors, which are just, we call them angels. They're just private individuals with a bit of money that they can invest um, speculatively. They might want to invest in it because it's solving, you know, a problem that perhaps they have or one of their relatives have. So that's good. But in terms of Uniseed, we will invest in absolutely everything, you know, clean tech, um, <laughs> I don't know, nanotech, uh, all sorts, you know, new materials, uh, goodness, we're, like the whole, you know, consumer electronics, sensors, AI, you know, that, like the whole gambit, basically. Um, carbon capture technology, that's all really good. Um, but some funds only focus, for example, on clean technology, in, in particular, solar tech. Um, so you've just got to be aware of who you're pitching to and what, what flavour of tech they're interested in. Uh, like I said, most funds are only interested in software. But some funds, like ourselves, Main Sequence Ventures, IP Group, are actually not particularly interested in software unless it's combined with sensors and, you know, has something really extra smart behind it. You know, business-to-business -business platforms uh, are probably not of much of interest to us. So always keep in mind who you're pitching to. 
and what they're interested in. So thanks for that question, long-winded answer. I hope that helped. Yeah, of course. I'm sure it's very relevant for the senior NATO audience. Um, yeah. Ali has a question. Do you want to switch on your mic? Thanks, Ali. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Natasha. That, that was a very interesting presentation, and uh, that, that, that's great that Sydney Nano arranged this, this meeting. I, I think that's very beneficial for lots of people here. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, probably you answered uh, one or two of them, but I want to reiterate on that. And uh, we developed a, meth a technique uh, around sustainability of uh, composites, and we developed and uh, uh, submitted a PCT. So the patent is there. Yeah. Uh, and I, I can see the interest in industry, a huge yeah. interest in different uh, industries. It's not just one sector. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but the problem is none of these industries are interested in uh, themselves to fund it or yeah. more they like to... Uh, uh, establish a, for example, company or establish a facility to do that, that work. Yeah. Yes. Technology. So uh, based on that, then we need to establish a company. Uh, but the, the, the other problem comes there that I don't want to uh, be heavily involved into establishing a company myself because I'm an academic and I prefer yeah. to do research. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that company needs facility to follow that technique and establish that technique. And uh, wondering if Unisits uh, supports those sorts of, for example, establishing facilities and firms and companies, for example. Well, it, you know, the answer is always perhaps, like I'd have to see it. But remember the questions that I want the answers to are the, are the more commercial ones. Um, and the best way, Ali, for you to start the process is, I, I don't know who you're dealing with at CDIP, whether it's Stephen Lamb. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the idea is like to have a chat to him and just find out where he, he is at and then say, you know, I saw Natasha yeah. present the other day. I think there could be a startup opportunity in here. You know, could, could we go and have a conversation with her? And, and he may come along or he may not. And then I'm going to come and see you. But guess what questions I'm going to want an answers to? A lot of those things. So you don't have to have all those answers at, at the moment. Um, but I'm going to really want to know, you know, who your key target customers are, what is in it for them, what you described just now. I didn't really understand the customer problem. I just heard a bit about science. So what problem are you solving for them? What solution are they getting? Why are you different to what is out there? Are you going to save them time or money or is it some regulatory risk you're going to help them with? Um, you know, what needs to be done to make this a company that can then serve those companies? What's the, what price are you going to be able to charge for this? Like all of those questions, you need to have at least the beginnings of a, a thought around. So that's, it, that's pretty much the process, you know, otherwise you're going to come to me and talk about your science with me and I'm going to find it all a bit too hard because I don't actually know if there's a customer problem here or not, unless I'm lucky to enough have, have worked in that industry or I've seen other people present and I've done some diligence on those industries before. I know all sorts about whale sensors now and all sorts of crazy things that I've got involved in and, and worthy things, but um, from what you just said, I'm not sure. So I think, does, does that make sense for you, that pathway? Yeah, 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 exactly. So we are in discussion with CDIP. Uh, yeah. The, uh, I think one of the feedback that I received from them, the first question they asked me, do you want to establish a company yourself and leave academia? Um, yeah. So and this is the sort of question that uh, put me in a very uh, hard position. Well, it's okay to say no. And, and to be honest with you, like researchers don't make the best commercial people. Of course you don't. You've been trained for different things. And actually, a lot of the time, you, you know, you shouldn't be leaving your academic position um, and going and doing a startup. But that Glenn that I talked to, <clears throat> spoke about earlier, 
might work, right? So you stay in the institution, but you do a little bit of work for the business or, you know, you just um, hand over wholesale the work that you've done so far. And, you know, if the equity of the university comes out one day, then you'll get a third, a third, a third, you know, you and, and the other inventors, if there's any. So don't worry about that. I think what they're just saying is, you know, do you want to be part of the startup? And it's fine not to be, right? But then the issue is, okay, who is going to be on the commercial side of the startup? And then it's a longer process, you know, like one, you've got to get investors like me interested. And then the second thing is often the early investors find the CEO, which is, you know, a commercial CEO to then put the team together under them, which sometimes includes technical people and, and sometimes doesn't. So, so that so, would happen before we establish company? Yeah, so and uh, yeah, pretty unit much. Seed and we can uh, get that. Yeah, well, it, it just depends, you know. Like, mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you could find someone to run the business that, that you trusted, that might be different, and then you could bring them to seed it with the business plan. So there's there's different ways of doing it, but at the end of the day, if it's a business, then you need someone running the business, and you may or may not need funding for that business, right? I mean. Sometimes if there's, and they're very hard to find, but if you can find someone who believes in the problem and the solution enough, you can have them working for nothing for something called sweat equity. So they'll own a proportion of the business in exchange for, you know, setting it up and, you know, getting funding for it or whatever, you know, getting initial customers or whatever needs to be done. So they're sort of buying their own job in a way with their own work. Fair enough. Thank you. Thanks very much. No problem, Ali. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from the floor? I might as well. That's actually a great presentation. I've sent you an email already taking you up on your offer. <laughs> um, okay. I love I've heard you give this presentation before, so it's lovely to hear it again. I mean, the conversation I'll have with you when you're here is really around the defence ecosystem. Do you have any experience there? Because that's a really interesting area where on the one hand there's massive investment sovereign and industrial capability yeah uh complicated and then at the same time in many cases universities will assign their ip to the commonwealth yeah it ends up in this actually, that's fascinating isn't it but i mean there's definitely if you look at amsl aero that you know that came out of phd work um you know, with Andrew Moore, then I'm pretty sure that that is a business that hasn't signed all of its IP over to the Commonwealth, right? So I guess it just depends. And I don't know the area that well, but, you know, I mean, maybe there's a great exit opportunity for an investor in there if, if the Commonwealth buys it, right? <laughs> like, the Commonwealth's uh, not particularly good at knowing what to do with universities. <laughs> I mean, that's the issue. And yeah, I know a uh, case you know, you know what's really interesting, though, Ben? I recently did a lot of diligence um, it, on a, a space opportunity, right? Which, again, is really well-funded by defence. Because um, from what I've heard, the, the first place people are going to go now is space, <laughs> not on the ground, you know, and, and hit out um, important uh, assets up there and um, or, or take them out one way or another. And, you know, what I found when I you know, when I spoke to the head of procurement for defence, um, was that defence seems to be a lot more enlightened than a hell of a lot of other industries out there about startup and ecosystems and helping things get off, off the ground. So I came away from that whole experience feeling very um, energised and enthusiastic about investing in something where defence would be involved, to be honest with you. <laughs> so... Yeah, um, I, I can't name that about too many other industries and, and government bodies, you know. Yeah. So well, I'll follow up. that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, so no, good stuff. I think yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, let's talk anyway. That I, I might have a little bit of an idea of what you're talking about because I do see what goes through CDIP. So um, anyway, we. Can, I was going to say you do, don't you? Because you've got as Uniseed. I wonder if this group of people knows how that works. How, do you, how does Uniseed sort of interface with the university? I mean, you get to see our inventions as they follow Cascade. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Ben. So um, I, I sit in the, the monthly IP meetings with the CDIP team, which is, um, which I always really love, actually. It's really interesting. And, 
if I'm interested in it, what happens out of that is um, the, the team at CDIP then give us a disclosure, which is, you know, a one pager on the technology and possible applications for it. Um, and then if we're interested, um, then what will happen is one of my team or me will then follow up with the researcher. And that's when we're, tre we're really trying to understand a bit more about the customer problem, a bit more about the science, where, is, where it's at, you know, sometimes the TRL level is, is interesting. Um, and I often then go away if I'm interested and make introductions to that researcher or, or myself even go and speak to customers. Well before sometimes even a working prototype because I'm that interested in it. So when the working prototype comes, then we have, I've already got a lot of ducks in a row. I understand the market opportunity. I understand the customers. I understand the route to market. <clears throat> and from there, what happens is the tech transfer office and the researcher, with a bit of my help, then come and present to our investment committee. And so depending on how the presentation goes at our investment committee, you know, then we, we look at investing or not. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. That, that's how we as a fund um, work with the uni. So I, I'm in and out, you know, talking to researchers all the time. And it's one of the, the joys of my job, actually, seeing the future. So interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll take one last question from Helena. Thanks, Helena. Oh, hi. Um, thank you very much for that, Natasha. My question comes from a slightly different angle. So I'm working with undergraduate students who are often in their final year of university and um, they're actually working on complex real world problems. They come together from different disciplines and yeah. they actually have to work with an external um, company or community. Yeah, I've heard about that. It's awesome. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I might talk to you a bit later about that, but my, yeah. what I'm doing currently is I'm reviewing our curriculum and yeah. very much want our assessment tasks to be very authentic. So it really interested me um, when you were talking about the, the, the kind of presentation that you would, you know, the elevator pitch that you would recommend that people get kind of familiar yeah. with. And yeah. I'm also, and, and to, to a certain extent, you just answered part of my question because you mentioned a one pager that yeah. um, explains the technology. And then if you're interested, that would be followed up with maybe a longer presentation to your um, investment community. So I was yeah. just wondering, what do those sort of authentic outputs look like um, to you um, if we were going to expose our students to some of those types of work yeah what would maybe the top three be well I guess it's problem solution market opportunity <laughs> you know, like that's that's sort of it because you can talk about the science you can talk about the problem and then you can reveal the opportunity right which is no one's solving it at the moment. There's a lot of people who are experiencing the pain. Um, you know, you can touch on competition a little bit. You can talk about the customer a little bit. And then for someone like me, you know, that's the very best place to start. Uh, and then, you know, from there we can, we can keep, you know, keep exploring whether there's really something here or not. So in, in your idea, there's not a major or in terms of what you'd like to receive if you were the, the customer, I'm um, not the customer, but the investor, yeah. you don't want to see, um, you want to see a short presentation? Well, I'd want to see a pitch deck. Um, so if you're coming to me cold and not through the university, so, it, you know, if the university is providing um, a disclosure, it's usually, it's, it probably has a few paragraphs and no more on the science. It'll say who the researchers are, the faculty, and it will talk about the problem and then it will mention a bit about the solution. And that's sort of it really. Um, and that gives us, you know, it may, may be a bit on the market opportunity if, if they can get that to hand quickly. Um, you know, then other things will come in like, is this better as a license opportunity? Yes, no, and you know, but, but they're always the main things. A pitch deck is if you're coming to me cold, say as a, a PhD student or something, then I'll want to see more of the business revealed. So that's when I want to understand, you know, the, the unit economics. What is this going to sell for? What is it going to cost you? You know, what's your route to market? Um, you know, like all, you know, a, a five year P&L is really helpful. We know that it won't work like that, but just that you've got a plan to take this to market and be profitable. And if it's an investor, 
if it's investor pitch, you know, that rem ramp of revenue is going to need to be quite steep. But Helena, I'm, I'm really happy um, to talk offline with you at some point and provide you with some of those materials, if that's helpful. Yeah, um, I'll, fo I'll follow up with that. Thanks. Yeah, no problems. Yeah. Thank you. We're just at time, a little bit over. So I'll hand back to Maria to conclude this session. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you. Thanks so much, AJ. And Natasha, a big thank you from all of us for, for your very um, informative and very content-rich presentation. And also a perspective that I believe is very complementary to what we do and what we're also trying to um, open up uh, to our colleagues at Sydney Nano speaking on behalf of the Catalyst and, uh, and of other representatives of uh, the business school and uh, of my colleagues in the larger community at the ECR forum. Uh, thanks a lot again, Paul, for uh, being here, for sharing your experience and your ideas with us. And uh, um, also great to have the discussion. And I hope that this uh, conversation is just a starting point for a number of uh, conversations that will happen as a result of this uh, uh, talk now. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Thanks, Maria. We'll Thanks, everyone, again. for joining us. Thanks, okay, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.